Okay, folks can grab a seat. We're going to get started. Page, $100. Welcome. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, feel free to grab whatever food and drink is left and grab a seat. Uh, welcome to Matter. How's everybody doing? Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. G glad to have all of you here. Uh, for those of you that have been here before, you know this is one of our uh, uh, anchor programs uh, that I'll call uh, Tales from the Trenches uh, that we do almost every month. Uh, listening to journeys of uh, entrepreneurs that uh, uh, have, have made their way through the trenches and are probably still in the trenches and still learning. So it's a great opportunity to learn a little bit more about what they're doing. Uh, this series, as uh, I think many of you know, uh, brought to us by a couple of our partners, uh, Jumpstart Ventures, uh, Rishi Shah, who's our moderator tonight, uh, and uh, Paragon Biosciences. Uh, so that's, uh, they've been uh, great support uh, supporters of this program. Uh, we have a really cool guest tonight, uh, David Van Sickle from Propeller Health. Uh, for those of you that might be familiar with his company, uh, he, he's got a really interesting background. We had an, actually an opportunity to do a roundtable with him and some of our members and partners right before this. Uh, so comes from a very interesting background, uh, an anthropologist turned CEO, and so we'll learn a little bit more about that uh, tonight. Uh, and lastly, I will just mention before I turn the stage over to them, uh, for those of you that uh, are following us uh, online, there are a number of uh, challenges that we are we are running right now. Actually, some some very good ones. Uh, one in the diabetes space with Novo Nordisk, one in health equity with Blue Cross Blue Shield, and one in primary care uh, with Advocate Aurora Healthcare. So these represent really interesting opportunities for our community to kind of put their collective minds together. Uh, create possible solutions for some of the bigger challenges that we're facing in this space. Uh, so I encourage all of you, if you haven't already, go on our website, matter.health slash challenges. Did I get that right? Uh, and you'll learn a little bit more about all three of those. So without further ado, uh, let me welcome uh, Rishi Shah and David Van Sickle. Hello, everyone. So, David, thank you for uh, for joining us uh, this evening, and great to, great to have you all here. I just got a chance to uh, to meet David, and he's got, as as always, a, a phenomenal story to, to share with us uh, tonight. And um, I'll let him start by telling us a little bit about what uh, Propeller Health is. And then, and then we'll go, we'll go back in time, and and then, and then bring us back out. Sounds good. Thanks, thanks for the chance to be here. I'm looking forward to the discussion tonight, and hopefully, it will be helpful to hear about um, my path to Propeller and and the company's um, progress over the years. To some of you, um, so we're probably best known for adding electronics to inhaled medicines. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, people who have chronic respiratory disease take uh, often multiple types of different inhalers. Um, and what Propeller does is essentially create technology that attaches to those medicines or is built into those medicines or in one way or another makes visible information about the use of those medicines. And then take that data and build with it um, digital experiences, interfaces and so on that can help an individual do a better job of uh, hopefully managing successfully asthma, COPD, what have you, with, uh, with less effort. Um, and then provide for their, for their physicians, for their uh, clinicians who are responsible for their health and the organizations who take care of them, really help them understand who, who's doing well under the current treatment and, and who might need more attention to get their, you know, their disease under control. So um, these, are two, uh, these are two therapeutic areas, two diseases where uh, despite what we know about them and we, all the great medicines that we have to treat them, people just aren't nearly uh, as well managed and as they should be. And so um, our goal is essentially to, to use digital and 
data about the day-to-day -day use of these medicines as well as what's happening around them in the community to help them uh, improve their, their care and treatment and outcomes and lower costs. You know, one of the things that um, struck me um, as I was learning about David's story is um, these days there's a lot of excitement around uh, digital, digital devices, connected devices. And David mentioned oftentimes it feels like we found the technology and now we're trying to find problems to solve with it. Um, his journey started in 2006 before even smartphones were around and probably is the first connected device of, of its kind that, uh, that, that we've seen. And so really an interesting journey. But you know, one of the most fun things about Tails is we like to take kind of the, the long road to, uh, to the founding story. So, uh, David, I'd love for you to, you to share a little bit more about your background. You know, where did you grow up? What were you thinking about, about doing if you didn't end up being a medical anthropologist? Uh, educate us on, on what that means, your, your time in India and in different cultures, learning about asthma and different respiratory conditions, and, and what, what ultimately led you into the CDC. Sure, yeah, so I grew up in, in Arizona. Uh, and ended up going to graduate school there. Um, I pretty quickly uh, knew that I didn't want to. Um, I didn't want to reproduce anthropology as my career. Right? I was really interested in the way that medical anthropology provided a perspective on disease patterns in the community. And asthma is just a, this uh, remarkable confluence of factors related to an individual's, uh, you know development of their immune system, exposure to the environment, things in their diet, lifestyle, etc. cetera. Um, and so it, uh, it ended up being this like perfect uh, topic for me to, to study from an anthropology perspective. So uh, in order to put myself through graduate school, I, uh, I got a job essentially at the Arizona Respiratory Center studying asthma in different communities where the epi was kind of un unknown. Um, so for the first uh, part of that, I spent time on the Navajo Reservation, which has a very different kind of manifestation of asthma than, uh, than, other, um, uh, you know, than other communities. I ended up then going from there to, uh, to Alaska, in the, the Yukon Kuskokwim area, and working with Yupik Eskimos on a still like different kind of uh, asthma. And, and not wholly different, but different enough that asthma is just not everywhere the same, so to speak. Um, and then, uh, through well, that, that challenged conventional wisdom, right? Most people think of asthma at that time particularly as more monolithic, is that right? And you were finding that in fact, even biologically and otherwise, it showed up and presented itself differently. Yeah, I think today people will, will, will recognize there's just a lot of phenotypic variability in what's called asthma, right? There's a, there's a lot underneath that common, that single term. Uh, but I was interested in it from an, from an anthro point of view. What's happening in the household? How are they taking care of it? What, what are, what's going on between a patient and their physician? Uh, what's the relationship between an individual and their environment? Early life, later life, et cetera. What happens if they have asthma for a long time? What goes on, what goes on to develop there? And I was working as part of a, these really um, fun multidisciplinary teams that include docs and scientists and anthro and so on. So it's this chance uh, uh, to see asthma kind of in a, in a community and to see what it meant to people and their families, right? And um, uh, I still, to this day, uh, those kinds of experiences, like in, in, in the real world of asthma, um, inform you know, the, the way I think about products uh, like Propeller and how digital can, can add value or kind of help unravel some of the complexity for, for uh, people and their families. Um, during graduate school then, uh, one of the first international surveys of asthma came out and, uh, and India showed up at the very bottom of the, of, the, of the figure, supposedly had the lowest rate of asthma in the world. And I happened to be in India at the time doing work on tobacco, uh, tobacco use on the, in the West Coast. And I, and I looked around and I was like, there's something wrong with the, with the global epi here. Um, and I wrote a grant to NSF to, to come back to India after you know, I'd gone back to the, to the States. And uh, it basically asked the question, is there something protecting people in India from, from asthma? Or is something else going on? Um, I ended up showing that it was, that the rates of asthma were just as high in India as they were anywhere else, and they were going up faster than they were in other places. And what was happening was that, um, that uh, Indian medical education was taking place using British terminology from about 20 to 30 years 
previously. So instead of getting told uh, or diagnosed with asthma, you got diagnosed with something like allergic bronchitis. And since there's no diagnostic test for asthma, and there still isn't today, um, you know, the way we assess the prevalence of asthma across the population is we ask a person, has the physician ever told you you have asthma? And they're like, no, I never heard that <laughs> word before. And by the way, if somebody, in, a physician in India did tell you that you had asthma, you'd be like, well, that, you are the worst doctor ever. I'm just going to go to the next doctor down the road uh, who will tell me I have something that's less scary than asthma, right? Uh, so it's sort of the medical marketplace gone totally amok. Um, by, by the way, that was like a 30-year question fulfilled for me because, you know, my, my parents are from India, uh, my father's a doctor, and I remember him saying, you know, growing up, I just don't recall people getting asthma like this in India. Yeah. And I've always wondered that too until about an hour ago when you explained yeah. that to me. Yeah. That's right. Um, so it, it, was a, it was a really just kind of um, crystallized this view of how um, how different and how many forces could, could operate on an individual in their, uh, you know, their health and well-being. Um, I came back from India. Um, I spent, ended up spending about two years over there, one in, in a rural area, one in an urban area, and, like, and writing about and studying kind of the, yeah. uh, the evolution of asthma and the, the rise of chronic disease, and respiratory disease in that setting. Um, my wife split after one year. <laughs> She's like, I'll see you later uh, back in the U.S. So <laughs> I, I stuck it out for another year and then came home. Um, Maybe we'll jump a little bit here. And, you know, so you have this background in um, medical anthropology, and you're studying respiratory conditions and how they present differently in different, different geographies, different cultures and places. Um, and, then, and then I caught in your, on your bio one of the, one of the best titles I think I've ever seen anybody have, um, and maybe it's just me, but you, know, you were a disease detective at the CDC's intelligence service for about three years. And that seems like a different movie every week to me. So I, I would love for you to share with us you know, what led you to the CDC, the intelligence service that's there, and, and how you would do that work of showing up at a new scene, maybe every day, every, every few, few days, and, and really figuring out, you know, was there an outbreak? What were you going to do in real time? And, and ultimately, how those experiences then shaped what you did after that. Yeah, so I came back from India, and I, I immediately knew I didn't want to be an academic. So I had this idea. I didn't want to follow the traditional path of a PhD. So I, I uh, signed up for the, the Epidemic Intelligence Service. It's a team of about 60 or so people at, um, at CDC and at, actually and at state, health, uh, state and city health departments across the U.S. Um, whose job it is to like, keep track of and, and, uh, and respond to outbreaks that are you know, of public health importance. I was particularly interested in respiratory. I thought that, um, that understanding an outbreak of asthma would actually teach me something new about it. Right? And I would be able to catch it in a moment of weakness and kind of use info against it. Um, what I didn't realize uh, was that that's not the way public health uh, practice works in the U.S. You basically sit around at a desk, you learn SAS, and you wait like a couple of years for a CSV file to show up. Uh, but more for it, asthma, right? For Versus, asthma, yeah. yeah. So, but in the meantime, you know, I'm uh, part of this group whose job it is, uh, it's called the Epidemic Intelligence Service, and uh, it's essentially doing these outbreak investigations. And I was doing all sorts of them, um, learning a lot because you're, 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 you know, you can't, you can't uh, dictate exactly what you want to work on day by day. So I worked on a chlorine disaster. I worked on uh, Katrina and Rita, uh, all sorts of other um, things. But I wasn't ever able to do anything in asthma. And I was getting super frustrated because I'm wearing this uniform and I'm, uh, you know, and I'm going to all these other outbreaks. And, but I'm not able to do anything in, kind of in the area where I really personally had a motivation to, to try to make a difference and impact on the world. Um, and I realized that the the problem was um, that the whole public health surveillance system for asthma was de developed from the top down, right? So what, what I would get were data about a hospitalization or emergency room visit, which is just the, like the tip of the iceberg of day-to-day -day asthma morbidity, right? You've got people having attacks, missing school, missing work, having all kind of morbidity across their daily life. But, but CDC and everything I was doing there was just designed to ignore all that and just to focus on the, the very small portion of the most severe events. Um, so I started to think there in my chair that um, a ground-up solution, like a bottoms-up citizen-powered solution, would be a really important complement to the top-down approach that, um, 
that, uh, you know, that, that we were practicing mm -hmm. in federal public health. At the same time, I started looking around in the, the medical literature, like what is the story of CDC or anybody finding an asthma epidemic? And there were two. There's one, and it's coming up again recently for whatever reason, where there's thunderstorm asthma in, in, uh, in like Australia and New Zealand. So these big thunderstorms happen and a whole bunch of people go to the emergency room for asthma. It's super interesting. What's the, what's the link there? Have we been able to understand that? Uh, there's some ideas, but still unknown. Yeah. I mean, that's what's so fascinating about asthma. Like, there's, we can't really explain why it rose in prevalence. We can't explain why it like plateaued and now it seems to be declining. Like we cook up these theories for its increase and then they don't make sense when the prevalence mm -hmm. rates turn the, the other way. Still like a totally misunderstood or not understood problem. Anyway, there's one other epidemic in the literature and it was this story about, um, about Barcelona. And I don't know if any of you have ever heard me talk about this, but there were, uh, in, the, in the early 1980s, 1981, physicians at four large hospitals in Barcelona started to report these days of asthma outbreaks. Um, so on, those, on these very specific days, their emergency rooms would be overwhelmed with people suffering from really severe attacks of asthma. And mm. unfortunately, those people were a lot more likely to die or to be admitted, hospitalized, um, than were people who visited for asthma on other days. Um, the city got pretty concerned. Um, these were starting to happen with increasing regularity. They assembled a team of all these, uh, these experts to try to figure out what was going on. They assembled all kinds of meteorological data, climate data, all kinds of stuff to try to identify if something was happening um, that, they could, that they could stop, that, you know, that they could intervene to stop. And they, they looked at all the clinical history and demographics of these patients. There wasn't anything unique about people who showed up on that day compared to people who showed up on other days. And in all the, like the environmental data, there wasn't anything interesting. It was all kind of what you'd expect. Um, so these days continue to happen, right? And over the course of the next eight years, there would be about 21 or 22 out asthma outbreak days. Um, the, the team that was called the Collaborative Asthma Group of Barcelona finally decided to bring back in all of the people who had had an asthma attack on those days. And they interviewed them. They sat them down. And then this is where anthropology enters the stage. They, they interviewed them. And they asked them to just recall where they were when their attack had began. And they put them on a map. And when they put the attacks on a map, it sh showed that, uh, well, wh what would you expect if it was air pollution, first of all? What would you expect the dots to look like? Concentrated, right? Yeah. No, the opposite. If it was air pollution, you would expect it to be like spread, spread out. out, right? Because, uh, you know, nitrogen dioxide or whatever is going to be dis diffuse across the city. But it wasn't. It was all these dots were concentrated in the harbor, that waterfront area of the city. And so after eight years of doing all this work, they were finally able to narrow the search down to the harbor and the waterfront. Um, one of the team had this idea to pull the manifests of the ships and barges that had called at the port of Barcelona and to evaluate or analyze the, um, the cargoes and to see if there was anything related or correlated between the cargoes that were loaded or unloaded and the days when asthma uh, outbreaks occurred. And turned out, sure enough, um, the one specific cargo was highly associated with these asthma outbreak days. Um, it was soybeans. Uh, and soybeans, uh, and finally in like 1987, uh, they published the results in the Lancet. They showed soybeans were this potent asthmogen that had never really been recognized before. The city of Barcelona installed the appropriate filters into the harbor silos uh, and it the, the never happened again. Um, and I, wow. I read that story in CDC and I thought, like what, I was so proud of epi and so proud of anthropology, and I was also so frustrated. I was like, oh my god, we're still doing it that same way today. Like, it, it's going to take me eight years of work to identify anything. I, I can't do anything for, for, for eight years. Uh, no way. And I can't wear this uniform, and I can't, uh, I'm unable to fax in my, you know, my public health service information for promotion, so I was just, <laughs> just failing. Um, and I, I, I realized that, um, yeah, that some kind of distributed public health system would, would really get us way farther down the public health path and let us target and evaluate interventions in much more real time than we ever could using the traditional data sources. Um, I got lured away from there to come up here um, and 
Yeah. Should so I may, keep maybe we'll, 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 you know, set the scene there. So it's, yeah. it's now 2006. Um, you're coming into the University of uh, Wisconsin, and you're doing, you're starting to do uh, research there at first, right? So you don't know it's going to turn into a company, but you've got this idea that if you can start to collect this data, you know, something will come of it. So tell us about that, and then, you know, re really, let's, let's go into as Mopolis uh, and what became Propeller. That was the, that was the predecessor name. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and what, what, you know, set the scene for how you started the company. Yeah, so I, so I had this idea that, well, that paper uh, in the Lancet and the following paper in the New England so, showed so clearly that knowing where and when asthma was happening in a community would, would be relevant to any kind of, like, future and intelligent public health. I had that idea. But this is 2006. I came up here. I took this like inc incredible uh, Robert Wood Johnson fellowship that gave me a budget to do high risk, high reward research uh, in asthma, and um, you know, and it took care of all of my res other responsibilities. So I could just sit there, and I cook I had this idea to connect, to essentially put GSM radios into inhaled medicines. Um, back then, nobody had a smartphone. Uh, of the, they didn't exist, uh, and so we were writing stuff in, in the brew language and basically putting Telet GSM modules on the side of an inhaler, which now, in retrospect, look like, like toasters on the side of an <laughs> inhaler. Um, but the idea was, hey, if you could build And how did you get them out there? How did you, you know, so you're, you're, you're doing this, you've, you've got these inhalers yeah. with the chips on, and how do, you, how do you get them out? How do you convince people to start using it? So we built the first one, um, and then I convinced, uh, well, the first question was like, um, you know, if you build this map of where, when, and among whom asthma is happening in a real time, in real time, would, would anybody care? Like, would public health care? Because I was still thinking about this from the public health angle. And, uh, and we got, we got, I got grant funding from CDC to run a trial, so then we built a bunch of devices. Um, we, uh, I actually drove around to laundromats uh, in Dane County and put up mm -hmm. flyers. In fact, we won a, an innovation award in Wisconsin the other day, and one of the guys in the audience was like, I saw the flyer in the Stoughton laundromat in <laughs> 2006, and I would called you to sign up for the trial. So I enrolled 50 people in a study using this uh, hair-brained uh, device. And they weren't getting any, there was no app because right. there were no smartphones. So essentially what they were getting was an email that we would like hand write, basically telling them at the end of the week, hey, heads up, you're using a lot more albuterol than you should be. That's the medicine you take if you have asthma to relieve an attack when it occurs. And it's a marker, like a vital sign of how well you're doing. You don't want to be using it at all, ideally. And if you're sticking with your like daily anti-inflammatory, you probably won't need to use it very much. But people aren't aware of that, so they just kind of go about their day. They learn to accommodate symptoms and so on and so forth. So just changing their expectations about how they're doing, maybe giving them some advice like, hey, I noticed that you're having um, a, a lot of symptoms at 9 o'clock every, every Monday morning. You might be exposed to something on the job. Like workplace asthma is pretty common. Here's something you can do to, to mitigate or avoid those exposures. So we were writing these like plain text emails and sending them back to people. And what we found in that first trial was we were able to cut the number of folks who had uncontrolled asthma by 50%. I was like, whoa, that's pretty cool. And I have this map of where asthma is happening in Dane County. Um, so through these emails, basically, the outbreaks or the times that they have to use the medicine for the attack yeah. you know, was cut by 50%. Right. So, so we saw this individual clinical benefit. what were the people benefit. doing differently? What this... this it was just... A, it, was, uh, it was really about changing expectations or mm -hmm. teaching them that they weren't doing well, basically, that there was a lot more that could be done to, uh, uh, to help them really control symptoms, right? Most people with asthma don't want to have an asthma attack. It's not like you're poorly managing asthma because in 30 years you're going to have some consequence. You're, you, know, you, you might have a, or your kid might have some kind of sequela tomorrow. So anyway, and uh, so what happened, though, was that we saw that individual clinical benefit, right? And then that started to dawn on me, like, oh, the only way the public health benefit is going to happen is if it benefits a lot of individuals. And then I have like a case. I can go make, I can give it to you and you and you'll get better. But then in, by aggregating that, we'll also then like materialize this new level of value, the public health value. Initially, I thought people would just sign up to do it because of the public health value. But once the individual benefit materialized, it felt like a lot easier to imagine it actually reaching some kind of scale. For the next couple of years, I just kept doing these iterations, um, you know, 
from sh shitty device to less shitty device to less shitty device. And like 50 people would seem to be about as many as I could get uh, just by myself driving around, um, po putting up posters and, um, and, you know, and accumulating clinical evidence. Uh, randomly in 2010, I happened to meet uh, a class, uh, one of my kid, my oldest kid's classmate's dad, uh, who went on to become the co-founder. He, a guy, Mark Gehring, one of the most gifted engineers you'll ever um, come across. He had, um, he had a background in regulated medical software, so he wrote the first um, 3D radiation treatment planning system, now owned by Philips. And he and the other co-founder, uh, a guy named Greg Tracy, were working on, had built a PAX company together uh, after that. They were working on another company um, that they were winding down, and, uh, and I was looking for you know, anybody who knew anything about engineering and had any interest in what I was doing. Um, and did you have a sense, you know, as you started doing research, at what point did it occur to you that this could be a business, that this might be a career, that you would go into business and start to really scale this? Was that not until you met him, or did you, did you have that sense early on? I didn't have that sense early on. Uh, it wasn't until I met them and I, like, kind of understood. Uh, I mean, this was before digital health, and so it felt like, like FDA felt very, um, uh, you know, very Yeti-like, like I was going to, like, run into them in the mountain in a snowstorm or something. Um, but until then, I called it ASMAP. It was like, it was this kind of hokey, uh, you know, project that like had this real-time map of asthma in Dane County, and, and I was pretty proud of that. Uh, there was 50 people in it every year. Um, and I also had absolutely no uh, velocity, right? I was just, every year, everything would come to a grinding halt. I would write a grant, I would get it funded. We'd do the whole thing over again. And when I met those guys and I heard about their story, it felt like, oh, well you could, there's another way to do this. Uh, and it doesn't involve the university life. And I was, a, like I said, I was gonna be a terrible anthropologist faculty. Uh, so uninterested in teaching people anthropology as much as I learned from it. Um, that I had to get out of there. So it was like this great path to, um, you know, to being a beginner again. Like I, I felt like I, every aspect of my career has just been kind of like a string of continually being a beginner at something. Um, and that's true today, actually, as the company grows up. It's just like, it's like novice, novice so time all over again. It, it's, it's, 20, it's 2010. Are you, are you scared to leave academia behind and to go from research to starting the company, and how, how did you know that you, know, you, you wanted to do it? Is there something that happened that, that made you do it? Um, and then tell us a little bit about fundraising. You know, you've raised four institutional rounds, uh, ten, tens of millions of dollars, um, and uh, what was that first round like? You know, what was it like to go out and you know, have to raise money, not from uh, grants, but, but from, from mm -hmm. you know, shareholders? Yeah, so uh, it's 2010. Um, my mom's actually uh, dying from, she had uh, metastatic brain cancer. She's dying. She gave me a, a loan, basically. She said, you have, to, you have to pay your brothers and sisters back, but I want you to, I want you to pursue this. And uh, um, at the same time, I got a call from, from Todd Park, who had, uh, was putting together all the, the work that the Obama administration would do around uh, health, you know, health tech or whatever. Um, I signed up to be at the, what was called the Community Health Data Initiative, like it's Health Data Palooza, but way back then. So it was, this is like February of 2010. Um, I knew I wasn't gonna, I didn't wanna be a faculty person and I wanted to, I wanted to have a, I wanted this to have a bigger life. I didn't know that it was gonna be a business or whatever, but I wanted to pursue it as much as I could. I got some money from my mom. Um, on January 9th. So that, that was the first round. It was an yeah, angel was investment from your mom. She got paid back, or my brothers and sister got paid back. <laughs> On January 9th, um, mom was or a good June investor. 9th, sorry. Yeah. 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 She, um, she unfortunately passed away, and uh, I was there with her and my siblings. And I left and got on a plane and went to D.C. and presented uh, as Mapolis, it was called then, at the Health Data Initiative. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think. Like it was Todd and that team and that community that came up around his in energy and enthusiasm for what um, technology could accomplish in, in healthcare that, uh, that convinced me that we could do something 
beyond what, what I was doing. Right. He, he highlighted it. He, he saw in it something I, I hadn't seen um, and the potential there. Uh, I mean, as did his team, like Amon and folks. And, um, and then I met those guys shortly thereafter, and, uh, and we, you know, I was ready to take it off campus. Um, and so what were the first days like? You know, I want to ask you, for example, what it was like to go and get FDA approval for one of the first connected device, devices of this kind. You're in uncharted territory. How did you approach that? What, what else were the initial challenges, the things that you remember now that were really pivotal and hard to do in the first year of, of the company? Yeah, so just quickly, so Todd's responsible for the first round. We had an angel round, and Todd introduced me to Mitch Caper. I don't know if, how, how well he's known here, but he was uh, one of the founders of Lotus. Uh, you know, not the car company, but the, <laughs> the, the, uh, the spreadsheet, yeah. So the best, part, the best story I have about Mitch is, uh, like, you know, I think Lotus had more than 100 million in revenue in year one or something like that. So um, he was always very disappointed in our, our revenue <laughs> productivity. Anyway, um, so he was one of the early angel investors, uh, along with a couple of other guys, uh, Jeff Rustino and, and Madison. Um, and we set out in the fall of 2010, uh, September, to build you know, the first kind of version that we would take to FDA. And fortunately, Greg and Mark, my co-founders, had all this background in taking taking technology to the agency. The first employee we hired uh, was, a, was a woman to uh, run regulatory, quality and regulatory at Propeller. So we kind of set up the company, built the quality management system uh, from day one, even though um, y we weren't kind of, kind of quite sure how FDA was going to review it. We just knew this is how they had done it at a PAX company. This is how they'd done it at a uh, you know, at a radiation treatment planning company, so let's just use a quality system and go, like, all steer right towards the FDA. And actually, the investor community at that time was really uncertain about what was going to happen with our, with our product. Like, is mm -hmm. FDA going to, what are they even going to think? Um, there weren't, weren't really any digital yeah, health Yeah, well, was there approvals. anything else before this in terms of a connected device of this kind, or...? I think there, the were, there, were a, there were a handful of things, but we were one of the first, I, I don't know, 10 or something to go, to go through and get a 510. We were a class 2 510K uh, on it. And until then, we had a really hard time getting in investors to, 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 you know, to take a risk on us. Um, Mitch and that, the rest of that angel round being an exception. And in fact, Walgreens was an earlier investor. Um, but for the most part, the reception to, to the pitch in, amongst the venture community was, you know, whoa, this is hardware, software. Uh, I think FDA is, gonna, is just going to send you guys down the road. No way. We'll, we'll call us back when you have mm -hmm. a 510K. And we thought, it was, we thought there was a pretty straightforward path, actually where the rest of the community thought was all up in arms about, you know, should we be working with the FDA to shape how this is going to go and, and all this stuff. We just kind of executed the 510K path that a traditional med device company would do. And we taught, you know, we got Were approval. you surprised by the process in any way? It sounds like maybe it was less painful than you might have feared it would be. Oh, yeah, it wasn't painful at all, actually. I mean, I think at that time, people were really afraid of the agency. And having worked in, in a federal agency, I was like, can we just call them up? And they're like, no, you no, know, never call the, you know, never call the agency. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, we should just call them up and ask them what to do. And uh, so we just never had a fear uh, yeah. that I think well, changed a lot of people's behavior. Yeah. yeah, but I can't take credit for that. Yeah. It, was, uh, it was, you know, our regulatory person. Just from the beginning, we kind of, set things up to right. go through a 510k process. Right. And uh, Have you now had many products approved? Uh, nine. Through the ten. process? Yeah. 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 Very, very interesting. And so, you know, beyond, beyond the F FDA, tell us a little bit about what, what the products are like in action now. Where, where will you see, you know, how many people in, in, are using the product? What have you seen from an outcomes perspective about the product? How will you work with, say, plans and payers and also some of the other, other stakeholders we talked about, like pharma. Yeah, so we, uh, we set out early on, uh, we thought there was a business because it would, if it, people got better from asthma, they wouldn't go to the emergency room or the hospital, right? So the model was, we're going to sell a propeller, or at the time it was called Asmapolis, 
Um, and please, you can make fun of me. You don't have to. Right, tell, no, but actually, let's sidetrack. Well, tell us about Asmapolis. Now, where were you when, when you thought of the name? And then what made you change it to Propeller? Such a great name. Yeah, yeah. It's like entirely unforgettable, but also impossible to pronounce. So it was like this branding marvel. Um, and uh, yeah, it ended up, you know, thankfully we named the company something else because, uh, uh, you know, we ended up having to change the name a couple of years back to Propeller when people who have COPD were getting like an asthmapolis kit. And they're like, I don't have asthma, and it would ah, be returned. Yeah. Um, but anyway. Uh, so we set out to sell to, uh, you know, at the same time, like the Obama administration is trying to get the Affordable Care Act passed, and we're like, oh yeah, value-based care, this is going to make a ton of sense. And, um, you, you know, uh, what ended up happening was we had, I was talking about this earlier, we had to build like kind of two paths, two companies almost, one that where Propeller, uh, you know, made sense where, um, you know, uh, fee-for-service survived, and one where that made sense when if the Affordable Care Act was sustained. And, um, and so if it's fee-for-service in that environment, um, yeah. what's the incentive? Uh, well, if you have an emergency room or a hospital, you, you, you don't like Propeller, right? Because you, uh, right. You, you're not, we're keeping people out of the ER and out of the hospitals. Most of those events with asthma are totally preventable treatment failures. Um, so the incentive for a patient is, uh, I don't really need to have right, days with symptoms. It's more consumer driven. At yeah, that it's point. consumer yeah. driven. Yeah, yeah, and okay. physicians obviously want people to be free from you know, yeah. days of asthma and so on. Um, but from a, from a delivery side, it was, it was going to be a different business. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we set out selling to them kind of on a per patient, uh, per time basis, uh, enrolling people, giving them propeller kits, and getting them going. Um, along the way, we realized that um, you know that pharma might be interested in this because we are driving adherence rates way up on the anti-inflammatories, the daily medicines that you're supposed to take to prevent symptoms from ever occurring. Um, those are like the branded expensive medicines that. that and how do you track those? You know, I have a, I have a sense of okay, if it's an emergency pen or what have you, you know, I can I, I can understand how you track that. If it's a medicine you're supposed to take every day that's preventative, how do you track the usage of Also that? inhaled. Yeah. So it's just the same kind of inhaler. Same inhaler, you just use the same chip. Yeah, you use the it. same device. Um, so we're lifting adherence like 55, 60% amongst people who enroll in, per, in Propeller and Farm is like, oh, that's great because uh, respiratory adherence is terrible in the U.S., something like 20, 20 to 25%, right? Mm. So they have these medicines that are highly effective at, uh, at controlling these diseases, but nobody uses them. So it's this huge opportunity. Um, and then on the plan and provider side, assuming you're at risk for the economics, like you're pretty frustrated. I don't want to keep paying for emergency room visits. It should never happen. Why am I on the hook for that? And if you're a patient, like you don't want to have days with symptoms, like I was saying. So, um, so anyway, the model was, well, let's sell to the providers. Well, pharma got interested. Um, and you know, over the past couple of years, the story of Propeller has really been about um, kind of the, the dawning on, on the respiratory drug makers that um, that the companies that survive are going to be the ones that like change the ex use digital to change the experience of chronic respiratory disease. These are still complicated medicines. the The condition itself is is confusing and difficult to manage. Um, you know, there's there's a lot you can do to provide support and to help augment um, and and improve that that experience. And uh, so those those pharma that have partnered with Propeller saw a way to help kind of, um, you know, to build adjuvants to their medicines with digital that could be beneficial to the patients, that could help provide value to, the, to their payer customers, and so on and so forth. So our revenue, our commercial model is kind of, um, it's sort of triangular in that we get some revenue from the drug maker, we get some revenue from the, the distributor, so to speak, whether that's a payer or a provider or a PBM, um, and the only person who doesn't really pay anything is the, is the patient um, in the system right now. Yeah. And so, you know, how many people out there are using Propeller products? Uh, today, about 45,000. Wow. Wow. That's terrific. And, and, you know, you mentioned Dignity as a provider that maybe has been a leader in, in how they're using Propeller. Um, you know, t talk a little bit about, you know, how Dignity is using it and, and, and how that relationship formed and, you know, how, how long that partnership has been in place. Yep. It was the first place we ever worked, actually. There's a photo of me in the office, like, carrying the first box of real sensors. <laughs> uh, and it's the one that got shipped to Dignity. We 
started running a randomized trial out there in April of 2012, right around when we got, uh, when we got FDA approval. Um, and that, that enrolled about 500 people into an in intervention in a control arm, and the folks in the intervention arm got all of the feedback and digital kind of uh, guidance and so on from the, from the system, and the people who didn't, or who were in the control group didn't. And same goes for their physicians. Like if, if you're in the control group, a physician couldn't see how you're doing. So we've, we've published a bunch of paper out, papers out of that trial now, but basically it showed a big reduction in days with symptoms, you know, big improvement in asthma control, and we're just about to publish papers showing reductions in ER visits and hospitalizations there. That was 2012. We're, um, we are now um, in negotiation for an enterprise expansion at Dignity, whatever year this is, 2018. Um, along the way, they've been a remarkable and supportive uh, you know, partner of ours, but it's just a, it's just a, uh, like an example of an embodiment of how slow it is to actually bring technology through to like a mm -hmm. fully digital clinical workflow. Um, it has been um, not for a lack of, uh, you know, support or enthusiasm on either side. It's just a very complicated thing to imagine, to reimagine kind of a patient's journey who has chronic respiratory disease and how to sort of make remake that in a digital image, yeah. if you will. One of the things that you've focused on um, for now 12 years is collecting this data in real time. But it started one way, you know, where the data would be collected and you might distribute back some insights that are actionable over an email. But that has really morphed, right? You, you, you mentioned based on your network, you're intelligent about the environment, about different causal factors, and you can actually adjust dosing, and, and, and you see a future where um, perhaps the treatment becomes much more dynamic based on the, the data that you're collecting in real time. And, and that's really a profound, I think, idea and concept. It's, it's not just you see something that's wrong and you, you, you send them an email. You're actually able to perhaps adjust the treatment uh, uh, based on all of these variables. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that could look in the future? Yeah, just to be clear, totally aspirational at this point, right? <laughs> um, yeah, not, not with, with my regulatory hat on, I'm not marketing that um, at the moment. But I think, I think the opportunity, so Rishi earlier was just asking me, like, what, what's going to happen here? Like, what, is, it, is this just about, like, you know, a fancy experience? Uh, but I think in, in, in respiratory and probably in lots of other therapeutic areas, um, I mean, if you look at the, the guidelines in respiratory, people should be uh, kind of, their, their treatment should be titrated, right? If they're not doing well, they should have an in, their dosage increased of inhaled steroids, maybe another medicine added on and so on until treatment is actually effective at controlling symptoms. And then you're supposed to back off when the treatment is working. You lower the dose and so on. So the guidelines already kind of lay all this out. But the guidelines are also like 700 pages long. They haven't been updated since 2008. There's boatloads of new literature about and, and whole new classes of medicines entering the market. It's a very complicated uh, thing for a clinician, uh, especially in primary care, uh, when they're not dealing with asthma all the time to be, to be managing. This is the kind of thing that, like, that can be automated so easily by, by a machine, right? And if a physician sets uh, like a target for an individual patient, there's no reason that the system shouldn't be able to intelligently and safely kind of guide that person towards uh, appropriate care and treatment along the way. It's just like the way you, you know, you don't navigate by having like, um, you know, Magellan sitting next to you in the seat. You just pick a destination and then it happens. Um, so from my perspective, there's like a ton of, of, of amazing work to do around what I think of as like digitally guided therapy here. Yeah. And um, basically, uh, helping people get to the right treatment faster and sooner and then withdrawing treatment too when it's not necessary. Um, a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of times what happens is people just end up kind of staying at the high dose and they never get back down for whatever reason. Um, and That's I feel really like we can do a, yeah. a lot more there. Yeah. I want to encourage all of you to log into social Q&A um, and submit any questions or upvote any questions you'd, you'd like us to ask David here. Uh, and um, a cu couple more questions, David, before we jump into Q&A. You know, one is hiring. You're at 100 people now. You know, it started with, with a couple, couple people. You know, how did you hire the early team? What lessons did you learn about that? Um, how has your job changed as an entrepreneur and CEO now versus at different stages of the company? 
And what do you, what do you, th how do you think it will change going forward? I still spend a lot of time on hiring, actually. Um, so I think a lot about that, about hiring um, and the kind of person who, who joins Propeller. Um, partly because, you know, I, I've been at the job for a long time, and um, maybe that's made me more acutely aware of the fact that if I'm not, if I'm not excited to go to work every day, uh, it's generally not because of something about the business or the problem or the commercial model. It's about the people that are around me in the environment. Am I having a good time? Am I like challenged mentally by, emotionally by people around me? And um, I'm so happy to say, like every people who who come to these kinds of missions and these this kind of this, you know, uh, the the company is like we didn't set out for it to be so damn complicated, but it's kind of fun that it's really complicated. Like it's hardware and it's software and it's regulated and it's a chronic disease that's intermittent in some cases and people forget they have it. And it's just like the, the problems are just endless. And so that's kind of what makes it a kind of an, an awesome way to spend your day, assuming that the people that are there with you are up for that. Um, so we call it, I call it like a creator uh, driven culture, right? Like if you're uncomfortable getting close to a problem or you expect to be handed like an IKEA sheet of how to solve the day's problems, like this is the wrong, the wrong place for you and I will actively dissuade you from interviewing the person after me in line because I, I need people who want to like, who, who want to have a great time and also uh, like get really close to really difficult issues and behind them is just more difficult issues uh, and we're just all together in it. We just went away, we spend a few days away camping, which is a very weird thing to explain to your wife. But we all go to like a lake camp in Wisconsin. and we The just, entire company. The entire company. That's everybody cool. comes from San Francisco. Everybody comes from Madison. We go camping at a, uh, at a lake, this great place called uh, Camp Wandawega. Um, and we just like think about the next year and all the problems that are there in front of us. And we recommit ourselves to, um, you know, the culture and the work and what's required to to, uh, you know, to serve the people that we care about. Um, what was, you know, so I'm a big fan of those sorts of off-sites and bringing the team together. What, what was your favorite insight? Was there something that, as CEO, you discovered, you know, um, or, or that a change in strategy that resulted from it? I, I always find that they're great for producing those sorts of things. <laughs> Yeah, year, year over year, uh, I, would, I get up and give kind of like a state of the company thing, like a plan for what's ahead. And at one point, somebody was like, hey, can we just not change our strategy so much this year? Like, <laughs> it would be awesome to just do more hatchet throwing and like bow and arrow stuff and no like massive shift in corporate strategy. So I underestimated how much people yeah. like to like um, have a vision for the company and not, um, not necessarily follow me down all of the paths that I go down in my you know, day to day musings about yeah. what digital is going to accomplish. Um, you know, we still obviously adapt and, and evolve what we're up to, uh, but the, the consistency of it was right, right. new to me. Now, now um, how about, you know, what's, what's next for you? As you think about your own future, you know, do you, how do you, how, you you've worked on asthma and respiratory conditions for a very long time. One of the, one of the top questions is why asthma? Is there a specific personal connection or passion? It's one of the first things I, I asked you as well, and, and, and I'd love for you to answer it, but, but you know, uh, 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 not really was, was kind of what, what, you know, so, um, you know, what, what's next for you? Do you, see, do you see this as a lifelong mission to, to work on this? Clearly, you have a passion for it, um, and so how do, you, how do you kind of think about that? Um, yeah, uh, asthma is just, it continues to be like, a total attraction to me. It's like a black hole for a time and attention of mine. I can spend all day long reading about it. I'm the most annoying slack poster of like all of the respiratory literature every day. Like make it stop. Um, but I, I am personally really excited about. Um, and what's interesting though is you don't have a respiratory condition. You don't have no, close don't. family members. You didn't grow up around it. I mean, well, it really is an intellectual asthma, but, yeah. fascination. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and just like a belief that there's something there's something really basic we can learn about our connection to the environment and our community and like that there's hard work to do to, to, right. make, um, to make people's lives easier and it can't all just be sublimated to the individual. I mean, what we do at Propeller is as much about um, making, to, on the digitally guided therapy uh, front, like 
we can see an envelope of risk kind of moving across a, a metropolitan area, right? We can see actually the manifestation of air pollution and in individual data points coming into the system. And there's no reason that that kind of information shouldn't filter back on an individual to make, to give them kind of new weapons to, to protect themselves and their family members. We've done that in Louisville. The data from Louisville flow through to, you know, to the administration, to the mayor's office, into public health, and to the air pollution control board, so they can go in and negotiate with a, you know, a stationary polluter and try to renegotiate a license, or they can plant trees, or they can reroute traffic, or whatever. That stuff, uh, that stuff is just hard, and but it's also so meaningful, and it's so much better than just just blaming people and saying you've got to change your behavior. Yeah, um, which is part of it, but man, it better not be everything. No, oh, that's, um, that's really so yeah. propellers. Uh, like this summer, uh, we, we took a round of venture investment um, led by a company called Aptar Pharma, which despite their name, don't make drugs. They make the delivery devices for different types of drugs, nasal inhalers, injectables, uh, inhalers, and so on. Um, and the, the vision there is to bring connectivity and digital like experiences to new therapeutic areas uh, in partnership with them. So I'm personally really excited about thinking about the opportunity in digital and chronic disease at a, like another level of abstraction. Where are there places where there's high unmet medical need? Where are there places where a, like a digital experience could be beneficial to people and their physicians? Um, and what is it about digital that's valuable? And personally, I feel like we're at the very, the very early days here. Um, if you if you think about like what happened in banking, right? Like. How much money does B of A spend every year on the mobile banking experience? And you compare that to like what digital, uh, what, how much dollars, how many dollars, <laughs> sorry, uh, pharma spends on the, the mobile COPD experience. Like it's just, it's just orders of magnitude different, right? Fascinating. Yet the same number of people bank at B of A as use GSK's medicines, for example. So we've got a little under 10 minutes, David. And so maybe we'll do a little bit of a lightning round and try to cover a couple of these questions. The first is around international. You know, can you talk a little bit about any, any plans you have, any objectives you have internationally, given that value-based care is becoming more of a global trend? Yeah, we're operating in about 16 countries right now, um, multiple languages, obviously, uh, for that. Uh, you know, basically think about where the franchise markets are uh, for, for respiratory pharma, so like EU5, Japan, et cetera. Um, so Propeller's already uh, working there, both commercially and in clinical programs. The, the next question here is, um, can you talk more about the balance between finding a niche while also, while, while cultivating being a beginner in your career? So I think this idea you've brought up about being a beginner while also continuing to pursue, you know, a strength or a, a niche that you're operating in. Mm. I don't really kind of, I don't, know what to say. Yeah. Um, well, 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 we can come back to it. Let, let's maybe move on to this interesting topic is, 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 is making care more equitable. Can you talk about health disparities in asthma? What is Propeller doing to ensure equitable access to your technology? Yeah, great, tough great question. question. Yeah. I think, um, but, well, as you may or may not know, asthma is a disproportionately a problem amongst um, uh, underserved and low-income folks across the U.S., uh, everywhere, actually, except in weird places like India, where it's very much a disease of uh, affluence. Um, in the U.S., we spend a disproportionate amount of time and, and effort um, on programs for, for low-income, like Medicaid and MCOs were actually one of the very first big kind of segments, customer segments for us. So um, the California Healthcare Foundation in particular was an early supporter of ours in getting Propeller installed in and used and evaluated by, um, by organizations like Dignity, actually. So they were behind uh, that relationship. Um, but that, that's a key part of it. I mean, you know, it, it's just, it, it goes to this point, like early on it felt like digital health was going to end up being kind of a, kind of a treatment for, um, you know, that was like, heavily focused on people who could afford it. And so, you know, we, Propeller's available in Spanish since, since day one, essentially, because asthma affects people who speak Spanish, like, surprise. But you couldn't, you couldn't show up at, we felt like, ethically, we couldn't show up at, at, a, at Kaiser or wherever and say, hey, this is just for, you know, right. English-speaking iPhone users. It was just, it was just not, it didn't make sense in the epi, it was off, and then it didn't make sense, like, 
for why we started the business. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you know, around the world, where do you see the biggest potential for digital therapeutics? Is there a market that you think is particularly hospitable to innovation, and wh where is that? Uh, personally, I can't speak for the company here, but I think that um, I think the market where there's uh, where there's tighter integration between all the way through the stack. So uh, if you think about like national payers or uh, a smaller number of uh, provider, uh, you know, big um, provider systems, uh, I think it's really interesting because from my perspective, I want to see the lo the loop or sort of I want to see the border between individual and public health just get knocked down. I'm right. kind of tired of Propeller having to traverse that border back and forth, like, you know, um, and demonstrating, hey, what's good for, for public health is also good for an individual and vice versa. Um, it, it, so would you me, say Europe sense. primarily? Yeah, or like, where, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Like big integrated uh, markets yeah. are really exciting to me personally, but yep. whether the company decides to go there or not, we'll see. You know, are, are you in Europe now? Yeah. You are, yeah. Um, this is an interesting one. You know, should more companies hire anthropologists? And if yes, why? You know, you're the first person with an anthropology background, hopefully not the last, to take the stage here with us at Tails. Um, and so do you think that there, there's wider applications of that background in health IT and, and, and more generally? Yeah, definitely. Um, two things though, anthropologists talk a lot, like me, um, and uh, so you gotta get them to actually just do stuff, right? Uh, so intervene, don't try to analyze forever before, before trying to solve the problem. I'm a big, uh, I've come to that realization later mm -hmm. in life. Uh, but you know the thing about anthropology is uh, it, it just teaches you to like get I mean it's all kind of now in the whole lean startup thing but yeah it just teaches you to get out and like be in the world and, and bring back um, learning and experience from from other people so that's all that's all you learn in graduate school which is why it was I was gonna be a really bad anthropologist um, how, uh, how about you know um, telehealth is there a potential for propeller to work with telehealth providers? Is that something you're doing already? Uh, yes, I think there is a potential there. I'm, I think chronic, chronic diseases like asthma, that could be supported, they could be supported by lots of different people that currently look after them, whether it's a pharmacist, hell, whether it's like a barber. I, I, I think there's, there's, not enough, um, there's not enough variability in how we think about surrounding people with support and, um, uh, you know, and, Right. And help, yeah. We, we talked a little bit about this. The question is, are payers expressing increased interest in Propeller? Um, are there any partnerships with ACOs on the horizon? I know, I know you already have many of those. Yeah, uh, payers are increasingly interested, not because, uh, um, well, just because we've lasted, basically. I think that's the only thing that really <laughs> matters to them. We've accumulated now a lot of evi clinical evidence that it's beneficial, right, and that there's an ROI for them and their population. They still want to focus digital and propeller specifically um, just on the tiniest portion of the population that's most costly to them, right? So it's usually a retrospective view of uh, trying to find the one guy who had, you know, 5,000 emergency room visits and like, let's give propeller to that guy, you know. We'll save $10 million and you'll get 15 in revenue or something. Um, so we're always trying to expand the sort of the, the, mm. the distribution with them and they're always trying to shrink it. Um, and we're, all, you know, we're always trying to demonstrate to them that like thinking prospectively, proactively about how to take care of these conditions means that you're not gonna have membership in the high utilizer population next year, but nobody, uh, it's, it's rare when people come to us with that view. Well, well David, this, this question's for me. You know, you, you know the digital therapeutic space well. You're, you're thinking about the whole, whole space while also doing a lot in asthma and respiratory. If you couldn't work in asthma and respiratory and you had to innovate using a digital therapeutic um, in, another, in another use case, yeah. what would it be? What, 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 where do you have conviction that this really ought to exist, that it doesn't yet exist? Oh, there's so many. Um, under, underserved ones right now, injury, like injury is such a huge problem, nobody pays any attention to it. Occupational health is another big giant one. So like whole, there's like whole divisions of CDC just sitting there waiting for somebody like you to show up and actually bring them into the take notes, area. yeah. Um, I'm personally, uh, I've been affected uh, a lot in my life by uh, hospital delirium. It's gotten some coverage in the news recently, but people were, have like these mental status changes late in life, generally in the ICU, and 
um, partly because those environments. What type are, of changes you mentioned? Uh, mental status mental changes. Status, so, yeah. Yeah, both my parents uh, are gone now, and both of them went through these periods of delirium uh, at the end of their life. That was that really took them away before we were able to say goodbye to them. And uh, I, I will come after that when I'm done with uh, with respiratory, because that was that that hit me and my siblings pretty hard. So. Well, great. Thank you again for sharing the story, your story, your propeller story. We hope to have you back here. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Richie.